Hello, everybody. Welcome to GTN or Galaxy Training Network Smorgasbord. Uh, this is our week long uh, asynchronous uh, kind of follow along at your own pace uh, virtual training that's being offered uh, through this week in May 2023. My name is Natalie Kucher. Uh, I'm part of the Galaxy community. I am based at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, in the US. Uh, so today I'm really excited to, first of all, welcome you to Smorgasbord and walk you through a tutorial uh, where we'll be able to introduce you to Galaxy. So uh, thanks everybody, let's uh, get started. So the goals of this tutorial today are going to be to learn the basics of using Galaxy. Uh, you'll be able to explore the tool and walk through uh, answering a scientific question without you necessarily needing to be uh, a biologist or a computer programmer. Um, so uh, the tutorial that we're going to be doing today is focused on a question in genomics, um, but there are many other tutorials on the Galaxy Training Network that uh, cover other scientific topics. So uh, there, and they provide uh, this kind of basis, uh, this background in the field that you'll need to know to kind of follow along with the analysis. And at the same time, uh, to answer some of these questions computationally, um, Galaxy will let you do that in a way where you don't have to know how to use the command line or code in a specific programming language. Uh, you'll be able to do that uh, by clicking around in the interface. Uh, so hopefully that should be something that you can follow. So uh, today in this session, I'm going to be walking through two tutorials. Uh, the first is an introduction to genomics and galaxy. Uh, so I'll walk through a little bit of the background for that. And then we're gonna use the extracting workflows from histories tutorial. Uh, and I'll explain what all those words mean uh, when we get to it. But as a preview, uh, we're going to do an analysis where we bring in data. And then uh, we might want to think about now that I've done this cool analysis, how can I do it again and again and again on other data sets uh, without having to necessarily go through all the steps of setting up uh, everything in the same way that we did? That way you can pick your data and then run the same analysis. Uh, so we'll get to that part when we uh, arrive at that section. Uh, but there are a lot of other great tutorials if this one doesn't uh, uh, if you kind of start here and you want to learn more or uh, you want to dive into a specific topic. Um, so in the Galaxy Training Network, uh, the tutorials are organized in different topics. So uh, there are really great tutorials in the introduction to Galaxy analysis, um, as well as using Galaxy and managing your data. Uh, so this will kind of give you the foundation uh, for how you can use uh, Galaxy for these uh, tasks. And then uh, there are more scientifically oriented uh, tutorials that are great as well to help you learn how to do a specific analysis in a specific field. Um, and then as you do more analysis with Galaxy, there are a couple of tutorials that I'd also recommend. Um, as you bring in more data, as you follow more steps where things are a little bit, uh, there's a bit more of a need for organization and tracking your data through the history, which I'll also talk about uh, what that means when we get to it. Uh, these are some good uh, rec tutorials that I would recommend. Okay, so now with that background set, uh, let's talk about some of the background and genomics that you might need to know for today's tutorial. So every uh, living organism uh, has DNA that uh, the molecules in our cells use uh, that help inform uh, what to make. Um, all of the proteins and molecules and enzymes and um, different compounds that are needed in our bodies for them to function. Uh, and then, you know, for plants, different structures and um, parts. So all of this information uh, is encoded in our DNA. And our DNA is organized into structures called chromosomes. So uh, the DNA, is made up of these four base pairs, A, C, T, and G. Uh, these represent uh, nucleic acids or nucleotides. The letters stand for longer, 
chemical names, but to abbreviate them, we'll stick to A, C, T, and G. And uh, the genome, uh, all of our DNA is organized into these long strands of DNA. And because there's so many of these strands, it's so long, the way that they get organized within our cells are onto chromosomes. So all humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Now, our chromosomes um, have two strands of DNA. So what that means is we have one strand that reads A, C, T, G, A, C, T, G uh, in different orders, repeated all for many, many bases long, uh, bases or nucleotides that I was uh, kind of talking about. Uh, and so uh, not only are, uh, is there this strand, um, the strand is also uh, complemented. Um, so every A will match up with a T and every C will match up with a G. Um, and so then there are these two strands that are bonded together. So we have the forward strand. You can imagine that like uh, reading a book, uh, you have kind of our sentences that are going forward from left to right uh, in the US as you might expect. Um, but the DNA is also complemented. So every base, you can imagine like every letter in the alphabet might have a different letter that it corresponds to. So it would be a pretty weird book to read, but uh, in our DNA, it's kind of matched like that, where every time you have an A, it matches up with a T. Every time you have a C, it matches up with a G. So this way, we get a forward strand and a reverse strand, and these two are bonded together, which is represented by this uh, ladder kind of looking structure here. So where are we at again? We have uh, our DNA, it's organized into strands. These strands are uh, organized into chromosomes and the chromosomes have two strands. So it has the forward strand and the reverse strand. Now, what's the kind of information that is encoded on these strands? Well, we have genes. Uh, our DNA is the basis for where our genes uh, are. Um, and we have genes that exist both on the forward strand, as we see here represented kind of on the top, and we have genes that exist on the reverse strand. So in the example with the book, uh, it might be a little funky, but you might get a scenario where uh, all the letters that are organized might have an opposite uh, and complementary, uh, so opposite and reverse uh, version of it that actually makes its own word or a gene in this example. Uh, so that's a really cool observation uh, that has been made. But one question is, are there genes on these forward strands and reverse strands that overlap? Um, it, it might be pretty crazy to imagine like in the English language example, um, but in our DNA, the way that it's organized chemically, are there genes that exist on these opposite strands uh, in the sections that overlap? So that uh, question is what we're going to be investigating in our tutorial today. So to do that, we're going to need a couple things. We're going to be using Galaxy as our platform to run this analysis. Uh, we're going to need uh, some data. So in this example, we're gonna be using uh, human genomics data, and uh, we're going to need uh, some tools in order to kind of do this analysis. Um, so in the human genome, uh, all of the chromosomes, all of those 23 pairs that we have are 3 billion bases long. So that's something we could try to do by hand, but would be greatly facilitated by having uh, an analysis platform. All right, so now that we have our motivating question, let's get into Galaxy. So to do that, I am going to open up my tab and I'm going to use um, usegalaxy.org uh, since that is a public server that's based in the US. Um, we have a couple other uh, main servers that look very similar to this. Um, and these are at usegalaxy.eu and uh, for uh, those based in Europe and usegalaxy.au, which is uh, a public instance based in Australia. So 
Uh, I would suggest using one of those uh, three main instances. Um, and then I would also suggest using the one that's closest to you. So um, what we have here is the Galaxy uh, interface. So now we're in the Galaxy platform and um, there's a bit going on here, so we can walk through that. So what do we have here? Here we have the main uh, Galaxy interface. Um, so there's a bit going on here, so I'm going to walk through the different uh, sections that we have. So up top here in the masthead, uh, we have uh, a couple of different um, options. So here we have um, a way to see our workflows, visualize our data, find shared data, get help, log in, and then a couple of these um, icons. So here you could explore the most current release notes of uh, the latest Galaxy release. These happen about three times a year. Uh, you can access the Galaxy training material. So once we get into the tutorial, I'm going to highlight how this can be really useful. And then there's this uh, window manager that you can use. So say, for example, you're trying to look at a couple of different files at a time, and you might want to uh, be able to see those in the same uh, view. So that's something that uh, this button will allow you to do. OK, so now here on the left side, we have this panel. It's called the tool panel. So um, there are a couple of different things we can do here. You can uh, search for a tool. Um, if you know there is a specific tool that you want to run on your data, you can upload data. Uh, so you can bring data into Galaxy, send data. You can uh, push data out of Galaxy. Uh, and there are a lot of different types of tools here. So uh, text tools, genomic file manipulation, uh, it, genomics, common genomics tools, uh, genomics analysis tools. Um, so there's a lot to explore here. Each of these is a header that you can click on and expand and look inside to see what tools exist there. And um, some of the names are really informative, so you can maybe understand what tool you're looking for from that. Uh, but there's also going to be a help section within each of the tools that will give you a better understanding of how to use them. So we'll we'll look at that when we're in the tutorial as well. And then I'm going to go to the far right side. So here we have our history, which I've kind of hinted at already in the introduction. So in this history, this is uh, the way that uh, all of the operations, all of the jobs and tools that are used, uh, every step of the analysis, um, all of this is tracked in the history uh, as an item. So uh, our first step in our tutorial is going to be to upload uh, data. So once that data is in here, there's going to be uh, a block similar to this blue one uh, where it's going to uh, show us that item uh, for with our data. And as we do each next step, uh, an, another item uh, will uh, go on top of uh, that item. So uh, each of them will build up uh, and that'll become a lot more clear once we actually start in the history. So then this final section, uh, this middle um, panel, um, when you log in, you'll see some announcements that are relevant to the Galaxy community. Um, this is really handy to check if uh, there's some recent news that you want to learn about. Um, this is also going to be the place where uh, when we pick a tool to run on our data, we're gonna be able to set parameters. So some specifications like what data do you want this tool to run on? And um, sometimes like what um, what file do I want as an export? Do you, do you want just the summary? Do you want all the intermediate files? Uh, those are um, options that you'll be able to set in the center panel. And then this is also going to be the place where we will be able to explore our data. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's uh, show you how the magic happens. So first, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to log in. So you can use Galaxy logged out, uh, but there are more limitations, like uh, you won't be able to save your work after you leave, and uh, you won't be able to have uh, multiple histories. So I'll have usually one history per analysis that I do or per tutorial. Uh, so if, uh, for example, I am trying to do multiple, uh, you couldn't uh, keep track of that with without logging in. So to do that, 
I'm going to log in. If you don't have an account, uh, you can also create an account this way. So I'll sign in with my email and my password. Let's see if I can get that right. Sometimes, there we go. <laughs> uh, my fingers got a little excited there. All right, so uh, now we're logged in. So the tutorial that we're going to go through today, I have it on the tab here, is Introduction to Genomics in Galaxy. Uh, so one way that you could follow this tutorial either by yourself or as you're working along with me is to um, flip back between these two tabs, uh, the GTN uh, training and uh, Galaxy. But another way that's really handy is if you flip over to the Galaxy tab and in the masthead, uh, you can click on this uh, graduation cap, see Galaxy training materials. If we click on that, Oh, it already remembers the tutorial that I was at. Uh, so I could scroll back up to the top here. Galaxy training, this is the screen that uh, you'll typically see. Uh, so it'll be the main landing page for uh, Galaxy training. So today uh, I'm going to uh, give an introductory tutorial. Uh, so that's going to be in this topic, Introduction to Galaxy Analyses. And uh, the tutorial that I'm going to do is Introduction to Genomics and Galaxy. So I'm going to click on that here. And now the same uh, tab that I was looking at in the other tab is going to be followed here. And it's going to remember the place that I was at um, in the tutorial. So if at any point we scroll through Introduction to Galaxy, we covered the introduction, the motivating question. Uh, here are some more definitions if you'd like to review those again. Uh, a couple of our background, a little bit of the background that we covered. Okay, so now we're at this next step called get human data. So uh, I can explore here uh, and read a little bit about the background of what we're doing. We've uh, talked about the, um, the main panels that we have here. And now we're at this step to get data into Galaxy. Okay, so we will use the get data toolbox in the tools panel on the left. So here, this is a screenshot that looks just like what we have on the left here. So let's see, we're going to click on the get data toolbox to expand it. So now I can click outside of this tutorial. I can click on data to expand. Uh, and wow, there are a lot of options. So let's go back to the tutorial to see exactly what we're looking for, and it remembered exactly where I was. Okay, so now the Get Data Toolbox contains a list of data sources that this Galaxy instance can get data directly from. Upload file is quite useful for getting data from your computer or from the web, uh, and so there's uh, another tutorial where you can learn how to do that, but today we're gonna use the UCSC main table browser. Um, so here, uh, I could even click on this tool and it's going to take me exactly there from the tutorial, or I can click that here, uh, and that's going to get me to the same place. So uh, now that I've clicked on that, you could either click Run Tool or you could uh, click on that tool on the left side panel, uh, and it's going to bring us into the UCSC table browser uh, to learn uh, what we uh, or to find the data that we want to bring in for our tutorial. So I know. Uh, the following steps that we're going to be using, but if you uh, want to follow this tutorial or with other tutorials, you can also keep that pulled up as well. Okay, so first we're going to use um, UCSC, this table browser, to find our data set. So for this example, uh, we can use uh, human data. So the clade uh, in mammal, we'll keep that the same, uh, but for the sake of exploration, it looks like UCSC also has vertebrate, uh, deuterostome, insect, nematode, um, viral data sets. So uh, if human uh, isn't your cup of tea, if you're interested in studying maybe other mammals, there are a lot of other data sets that are available here. But we'll stick with human. And next is this piece called the assembly. So um, here, 
uh, UCSC, the browser is, uh, has already pre-selected some things for me. So I see that there's this assembly from December, 2013 called GRCH38. Let's click on this to see what else is here. So it looks like there are a couple of other options that we could select. Um, there are some past versions earlier than 2013. And then very excitingly, most recently, there's been uh, an updated uh, assembly or an updated version of the full human genome that's been uh, created and released. Um, so this is really scientifically cool because there are some parts of the genome that are really hard for uh, that were really hard for the existing uh, sequencing um, technologies to really uh, elucidate, to better understand, uh, and uh, be able to uh, find the correct order of them. Um, and so with newer technologies that support uh, reading longer and longer sections of DNA or of uh, our uh, fragments of DNA, um, now we were able to create a more complete assembly. Um, so uh, T2T here stands for telomere to telomere. So representing these ends of each of our chromosomes, these uh, sections called the telomeres. So there's a telomere to telomere assembly of the human genome, uh, which is really exciting to use. And I would suggest running through this tutorial using this, um, maybe uh, after completing uh, this version. So let's stick with this. Uh, December 2013, GRCH38. And then what we're looking for. So let's see, we have some options here. Genes and gene predictions are selected. Um, thinking back to our question, we want to identify areas of the chromosome where the genes overlap. So I think here, this group, genes and gene predictions, uh, is going to help us understand which genes are on the forward strand and which are on the reverse strand. So I'll click that. And then we'll use this track gen code B43. So that's going to um, help us to have those annotations or uh, that information about where the gene starts, where the gene ends. Table known gene. I think that worked for us. Okay, so so far, uh, I've done a little bit of explaining, but haven't really changed anything. Uh, that's been selected so far. So now uh, we define the region of interest. So for the purpose of the tutorial, um, we could either look across the whole entire genome, so all 3 billion uh, bases in the genome. Um, but for this purpose, um, we're going to want to look at a smaller section. Um, and this can be maybe our hypothesis. We can test this in one chromosome and then uh, go beyond that to a larger um, uh, a larger data set uh, if we find something that's confusing or if we find something that's really exciting and wanna see, is this true across the whole genome? Uh, so for this example, we're gonna use chromosome 22. And so chromosome is denoted by CHR22. So I'm going to um, change that uh, field so that it only says CHR22. All right, that looks good. And let's see, there's this option that optional, retrieve and display data. Okay, so the, out, the output format is going to be this for, file format called bed or browser extensible data that works for us and set, send the output to Galaxy. So since we came from Galaxy, it knows that we want that data to go back into Galaxy to analyze. So um, I think that all looks good. So again, on this page, the only thing that we've changed here is this position to CHR22. Okay, let's click on get output. Okay, now that we are here, I have one more step. So there's an option to include a custom track header. Uh, we're gonna skip that for now. And then create one bed record. Uh, and so uh, one record that's going to be one row per whole gene. I think that works for us for now. So let's stick with that whole gene and now send the query to Galaxy. Okay, job has been successfully added to the queue uh, and it uh, sent us right back to our Galaxy uh, platform. Uh, so this is starting to look a little bit more familiar. But the difference here now is that we have this item in our history. So 
um, based on that tool that we used. It's UCSC main on human known gene chromosome 22 colon, and then it's base one to uh, base 50 million in that chromosome. So that's, that's going to be a lot of bases. I, I, I'm guessing there are going to be a lot of genes in there. So now we have this data. Um, first, the box started out as gray. So that means that the job is in the queue. It's being loaded. Um, and now that it's yellow, it's been submitted and the job is running. So after uh, a moment, uh, once that data is loaded, the box is going to turn green. Uh, and that's going to mean that the job was successful and the data was brought in successfully. Uh, so sometimes you'll have a job that runs and it turns green, uh, but it didn't do exactly what you expected it to. So sometimes it's good to ask questions of your data to see, uh, did this do what I expected? Did the tool work in the way that I expected on my data? And then sometimes it will turn red. So that would mean that uh, the data did not get successfully loaded or the tool did not run successfully. There was some error. Uh, so that would mean um, there is an issue. Uh, a lot of times I recommend rerunning the job. Uh, so I'll show you how to do that a little bit later. Uh, but for now, uh, uh, and it also might mean that you need to uh, look into the uh, into the issue a little bit more to see what's going on. Okay, so now um, that box turned green. My data has been successfully uploaded. And what can I, I can do here in the history is I can click on this item and I'm going to get a preview of my data set. So there will also be some metadata or some data about my data uh, that is shown in this preview. So here we see we have 5,353 regions. Uh, this number might be a little bit different than the tutorial because of an updated version of gen code that's being used, um, but it's still around the same amount, uh, a little bit higher, I think. And then what we have here is some information. So the format of this file is a bed file and the database that's using being used is HG38. So that um, assembly that we uh, that we selected in the last page um, is that human genome 38 uh, version. And now we get a little bit of a preview of our data set here. So we can see it looks kind of like a table. So it must be a table. And there are a number of different columns. Some of them have names. So uh, there's this one column with chrome. So I, because this looks like CHR22, that looks like chromosome. So chromosome 22, that looks right. Now we have a uh, start and end. So these are going to be the uh, base number, the position where this gene in this row on chromosome 22, it starts at this position. What is that? So that's 10,736,170 if base is where it starts and it ends at 10,736,283. So 170 to 283, it's a little bit over uh, 100 uh, bases long. So that's the size of our first gene. Uh, we get some other information about the gene that's encoded in this row and then possibly uh, a quality score. Um, and then this next column six is going to give us information on the strand. So what strand is uh, this gene on? So the first row, the first gene that we have is on the minus strand. So that's just a notation for the reverse strand. So we have one row on the uh, reverse, another on the reverse, one on the forward, another on the forward, another on the reverse. So um, this is going to be a big file full of all of these genes that are on chromosome 22. And then there are going to be 5,000 of these genes, actually. So we got a little bit of information from this preview. But if we wanted to take a deeper look at the data, what we can do is click on this eyeball, poke it in the eyeball. And now what will happen uh, is we see this fuller uh, view of uh, this table that we were just looking at here uh, in the main panel. So again, have that same information, chromosome 22, 
I'd expect if I scrolled through this whole entire file, all of the entries, all of the rows would say chromosome 22. You could do that and check yourself if you'd like. Uh, we'll have the start position, the end position again, uh, and then this strand information, which is going to be really helpful to us. Okay, so now that we brought in our data, um, it actually isn't oops, super informative for me to look at this and see, uh, okay, UCSC main. Uh, I'm going to want to make the name of my data set a little bit more informative. So to do that, I'm going to click on this pencil. And it's going to take me to a form where I can uh, update the name of my data set. So here I'm going to type in, uh, let's call this genes on chromosome 22. So here I'm able to update the name. Uh, there's also other information that you can update here. Um, so this all looks good to me. I'm going to click save. And now I see that that's updated here. So that looks great. Now, uh, thinking again on our question, um, we want to see which uh, genes on the forward strand overlap with the genes on the reverse strand. Uh, so what I might do next is uh, split uh, this file and separate out all of the genes that are on the forward strand from the genes that are on the reverse strand. So there are a couple of different ways that we can do this. So this is gonna be our opportunity to look for a tool to, um, to uh, operate on our data set on this table. So I'm going to look on the tool panel on the left-hand side. So in the tutorial, uh, it already tells us exactly which tool we need to use. Um, but say you're doing an exam, uh, an analysis, uh, and you don't know exactly what tool makes sense to use. Uh, so maybe let's look through that a little bit. So um, we were thinking to uh, split our our table, right? Um, to split out those genes on the reverse and the genes on the forward. Um, so maybe something like filter makes sense, where I can filter out the reverse strain genes on into one file and the forward on another. So let's expand this and see if there's anything here that sounds like it could be useful. Extract features from DFF data. I'm not familiar with that. Filter data on any column using simple expressions. That, that sounds kind of right. So let's maybe click on this tool and see what it shows us. So I uh, have the name of the tool here. Uh, so here I see a section on the tool parameters. So filter, uh, this is, I guess, where we can uh, select the data set that we want to filter on. Okay, that sounds fair. With the following condition, C1 equals chromosome 22, number of header lines to skip zero. Okay, and then there may be some additional options. So let's let's look under the help section to see if we can learn a little bit about how this tool operates. So maybe let's look under this heading syntax. So the filter tool allows you to restrict the data set using simple conditional statements. Columns are referenced with C and a number. For example, C1 refers to the first column of a tab delimited file. Uh, what we have looks like a tab delimited file. So uh, we're going to want to um, filter maybe on this column six for a plus and then for a minus. Um, okay, make sure that multi-character operators contain no white space. Okay, when using equal to operator uh, double equal sign must be used. Okay, non-numerical values must be in single or double quotes. Okay, so if it's a number, it doesn't have to be in quotes, but if it's not a number, it should be in quotes. And then uh, filtering conditions can include logical operators. So it's getting a little bit maybe more into the computer science where you can um, make a little bit more complex, complex expressions. Okay, so let's see an example. C1, so column one equals chromosome one. So it selects lines in which the first column is chromosome one. Okay, so it sounds like with a little bit of modification, we can update that and maybe say, we're looking at column six and see if that equals plus or see if that equals minus. 
Um, so let's give that a try. It looks like there are some more complicated examples uh, further on, but for our, our case, let's see if we can uh, if we can use this. So with the following condition, C1, let's change this to C6, and then equals to chromosome 22. Uh, let's uh, filter first for the genes on the positive strand. So I'm gonna change that to a plus sign. Uh, number of header lines to skip, we'll keep that at zero. Okay, I think we're ready to run the tool. Okay, so now we have this nice big green check mark on the right in my history. I see uh, we have a job that's um, queued and I click on that here. Now it says the job is currently running. Great. So I'm gonna close that up again. So it's telling you the tool uses this input, uh, our genes on chromosome 22, and, uh, and it produces this output, which is a filter on data one. Great. So uh, if we're looking for these genes um, and we're wanting to uh, fill, uh, split this out, we might expect that you know maybe roughly half of the genes are on the forward strand and roughly half are on the reverse strand. So maybe we can keep that in mind as we look at uh, this data set. So moment of truth, I'm going to uh, click on that data. Let's see, maybe it needs another hand. Or maybe we can refresh. So I'm not uh, able to see a preview here for some reason. Maybe let's poke the data in the eye and that way we can uh, take a look. Okay, so here uh, we can do another kind of sanity check to see uh, did did this tool actually run the way that we expected it to? So in the preview of our first data set, we had on the strands some minuses, some pluses, but here uh, I'm just seeing pluses all the way down. So we could go and manually check, uh, you know, so far this looks like uh, everything that we have here is pluses. So I think that that was uh, a successful run of this filter data. Um, to get all the forward, the genes on the forward strand. So to make sure that I remember what we did here and what data set we have here, I'm going to change the name. So again, click on the pencil. And then uh, from filter on data one, I'm going to call this um, forward genes from some 22. Oops, forward. And now I'll scroll down and save. Okay, so uh, the preview did end up popping up now. So what we can see here is we have 2,831 regions from what we started with as 5,353 regions. So, okay, we, we did have um, a bit fewer uh, or so this does look like a subset of our original data set. And in this box here, we have some information on the, the job that we just ran. So filtering with column six equals positive for forward strand. And we get a nice view that here, there's about 50 to 53% of those 5,000 lines in our original data set. So that's really exciting. That looks like it was successful. Now let's do this operation again but looking for the genes on the reverse strand from our original data set. So a really handy tool that I was referencing earlier uh, in a situation where maybe you have a job that doesn't uh, run successfully, you end up with a red box, <laughs> a really handy tip sometimes is just to try it again. Uh, but in this situation, uh, we're gonna wanna set up a, the tool where everything is the same, except for instead of the plus, we want a minus to get the reverse strand. So to do that, we'll click on this uh, curved arrow uh, and the tooltip that we have that comes up is to run the job again. So uh, instead of it kind of going forward and running already, we'll get to set those parameters again. So here, I still want to use the um, full uh, list of genes from chromosome 22 but now I'm gonna change that position 
uh, the condition, excuse me, for this to be equal, equal to um, minus for the reverse strand. And now I'll click run tool. Great, that uh, was also a success. So now that I am thinking um, through uh, what this might be doing, uh, I would expect that we'll get uh, everything that wasn't in this first um, first kind of sectioning. So uh, of that 5,300 that we started, we got uh, 2,800 here, about 52 uh, and some percent. So I'm going to expect that once we run this operation, we're going to get that remaining uh, 47 uh, or so percent. Um, so once that job finishes running, we'll be able to double check that and know that uh, we've captured all of the genes that are on uh, chromosome 22. So we'll give that uh, another moment or so to run. Great, so our uh, next job brand here, we have um, filter on data one. Let's open that up. Okay, so here we have 2,500 and so uh, regions, uh, got that information and there it is, the 47% uh, remaining uh, is what we have in this file. So super. So again, I'm going to rename this. I'll click on the pencil here. I'm going to call this uh, reverse genes from some 22, and I'll save that. Great. So now that that's updated, I will click on this item again to shrink it. And now we have a, a more full view of our history. So now we have the forward strands, we have the reverse strands. Next, we're going to want to look at where they overlap. So one thing we can do, we can look uh, back in the tutorial. Uh, so what did we do? Get the human data, we got that, we've got the data. What's the plan for answering the question? So, okay, split the genes into forward and reverse data sets. Okay, next we're going to check for overlaps. So here, what we're reading is genes are an example of a genomic interval. So it's a part that spans part of the chromosome. Um, and uh, we're going to want to look at uh, if this interval, this section of the chromosome has any uh, overlap or intersection uh, is another word that we can use that for uh, understanding the places where they, where they overlap. So, what we can do here um, is going back into our tools, in the tools on operate on genomic intervals toolbox, join and intersect have the most promise. Let's try intersect. Okay, so I'm going to click back uh, into uh, Galaxy here, going to close uh, this uh, category. Okay, look. Ah, all right, under common genomics tools, operate on genomic intervals. Let's find that intersect tool. So intersect the intervals of two data sets, super. So let's take a look at this. So here, again, we have our section for tool parameters. Uh, let's look at the help just to make sure that we're uh, doing the operation that we expect to be doing with this tool. So here it's showing that there are some examples of how we can use this. So there's, we can uh, set the parameter to look at overlapping intervals or overlapping pieces of intervals. So in this first part, we will have our first data set. So here we're going to be using the forward genes and the second data set, so the reverse genes. And what this selection of overlapping intervals is going to return to us is it's going to return the whole gene from that forward list where there's any overlap with the second data set. Under the second selection, over, overlapping pieces of intervals, uh, what it would return to us in looking where the, that intersection happens, we would only get the segment 
where the overlap occurs. So we're going to lose some information in the first gene. Uh, or we're going to lose the information across that whole gene. So I think what we would want to do here is um, select the overlapping intervals option. So uh, here we can maybe run this two times. So first, the first data set will be uh, the forward genes where they intersect with the reverse genes. So we'll get a list of all the forward genes. And then maybe we can flip it so that uh, the second data set, uh, the, the first data set turns into our reverse genes so that we'll get that full reverse genes information. Okay. So I'm going to scroll up to the top again. We're going to want to select the overlapping intervals of, let's start with the forward genes that intersect the reverse genes. So those forward genes is going to be our first data set. The reverse genes will be our second data set. Uh, and we want to uh, include in the results any uh, any genes that overlap for at least one base pair. Sure, that looks that looks good. So now uh, we can run this tool. So here we're going to get that intersection between the forward and the reverse with the spit out is going to be the genes, that whole gene where there's any part of it that overlaps. So um, we have got that tool started. We have that here in our history now. So this is going to take a, a moment for uh, the job to load it and to be submitted. Once we complete that step, uh, we're going to want to do the same thing uh, with this time the reverse uh, genes uh, so that we can collect all that information about the reverse genes. OK, so now that uh, that tool has run, I'm going to click on the preview. Uh, maybe I clicked on it a little too early, so we won't get the preview. So I'm going to poke it in the eye and see what output we have. So here we have uh, a list of genes. All of these look to be on the forward strand, has that plus sign in the column six. and I would expect for this, uh, the number of regions or the number of um, rows in this table to be fewer than our forward genes list, because uh, I don't know how common it is that the forward overlap with the reverse, but I'm going to guess that maybe it's not that common. Um, so let's keep track of this data set. I'm going to name it overlapping forward genes. And I'm going to save that here. OK, so that, that updated and uh, shared us the preview. Yeah, so now, as opposed to um, our original, uh, where we had, uh, I think it was like 2,800 regions, now we have uh, over 1,000 regions. So uh, that's still a bit higher than, uh, so I guess that's maybe around a little under half uh, of those genes on the forward strand overlap with the reverse. Uh, so let's run that again, uh, this time getting the information on the reverse genes. And we can uh, do the shortcut uh, to run the job again, uh, where in this situation, we can swap these two data sets. So I'm going to move, uh, make this the reverse genes. And I'm going to make this the forward genes. And now I'm going to click run. So now this um, job has been uh, submitted. Here it is. It's being scheduled. Can close that up. And so now uh, we're going to be able to analyze um, where that intersection is happening. Um, and this list that we're going to get are the overlapping reverse genes. So now we have the overlapping reverse uh, genes uh, from this run. So I'm going to click on this item. And we have, uh, again, about half, so 937 of that original 
um, 2300, I think, from the reverse G that we had. So let's uh, again change the name of this data set. And we can call this the overlapping reverse genes. Uh, so we don't lose track. Okay, so now once that name updates, now we have, uh, I think, a lot of the information that we need to be able to answer our question. Um, so we were able to see that uh, we were able to bring in the data from a human chromosome, uh, and that data were was the genes that are on that human chromosome 22. We were able to pull out which genes are on the forward strand and pull out which genes are on the reverse strand. And then we were able to do an analysis where we found out where does that forward strand overlap with the reverse strand and how many genes overlap on, how many genes from the forward strand overlap and how many genes from the reverse strand overlap. Uh, and we got a bit uh, of a big answer. So it's pretty um, a pretty high number. There are 1,122 on the forward strand and 937 on the reverse strand. So uh, we might want to now combine these data sets together um, so that uh, we can, you know, if you're using this analysis in a publication, uh, we can bring those data sets together. So I'm going to use a tool um, in the toolbox, maybe under join. So compare two data sets, group data by column, join two data sets side by side. I'd want to kind of join them top to bottom. So subtract, that doesn't look right. Okay, maybe under text manipulation. Okay, add, change, column, concatenate. Okay, so we can concatenate the data sets to, to head. Uh, so um, just, uh, paste them uh, together into a, a new file. So let's click on this tool. Okay, let's see if this gives us uh, a handy explanation of what this tool is going to do, what it does, concatenates data sets. So in this example, we're concatenating this data set that has a couple of uh, regions from chromosome X with a data set one, with chrom uh, genes on chromosome one, and data set two uh, with uh, some genes on chromosome two. And this tool is going to result in the following. So we have chromosome X, one, and two. So that looks right. Uh, we're gonna want to combine those data sets together. So uh, let's go ahead and use this tool to do that. So we're going to want to connect, concatenate the data set. Let's uh, pick the forward genes. Those will be on top. Uh, for no particular reason, I guess. And then insert data set, uh, we'll want to uh, combine that with the overlapping reverse genes. Okay, now let's run that tool. So this is going to um, combine our, our data sets together. And once it runs, we'll um, probably also want to rename the data set so that it's a little bit more informative. So now what we were able to do uh, is we have our list of these overlapping genes. And uh, one next step that we can think about is actually taking a look at uh, the data and uh, using a really important tool in our uh, tool belt of genomics uh, and general data analysis to actually take a look at the data. So we've been doing a little bit of that um, through these previews and looking at the data um, but we can take another eye at uh, with some tools that have been developed to actually look at what this data looks like on the genome. So before we do that, I'm going to rename this data set. And I'm going to call this overlapping genes. And then I'm going to save this. Wonderful. So now, let's close these up. Overlapping genes. So here, 
I am going to use um, one of these icons here. Uh, this one that looks like a little bit of a bar graph uh, is the visualize option. So here I'm going to click on this button. And now I see um, a bunch of different options that I have for visualization. So there are maybe different tables that I can create. But I am looking for, ah, okay. So I had to scroll down before I could scroll up. I'm looking for uh, the UCSC genome browser. So this is a tool developed by the folks at UCSC where we brought in our data from actually. Um, and this is a tool that's going to let us look uh, visually at what the genome uh, looks like. So I'm going to click on main, and this is going to open another tab uh, with that genome browser. So now it's looking like our genome browser is loaded. Uh, there's a lot of information here that we see. So uh, maybe we can start from the top and work our way down. So we see here that we're looking at the genome browser on human uh, with the specific reference that uh, we selected. Uh, so that means that what we're looking at is being compared to um, uh, this version of the genome that we have a lot of information about. So whatever we bring into that, uh, it's going to be compared to this reference, and we're going to be able to um, compare what we have to uh, what that uh, references. So then we have a couple of different options and how we can explore. Uh, so here, the region that we're looking at is pretty big um, across the entire chromosome 22. This red box is showing what is being highlighted in this section. And uh, here is the user track. So this is what uh, we have supplied, this is the data that we brought in from our Galaxy instance. And uh, here below is all that information from GenCode about what genes and what transcripts are included um, in, in these areas on chromosome 22. So we can see that there's some uh, overlap with uh, some of these larger uh, black boxes and sections. Um, but we're looking across a really big section. So here we're looking from this 16 million base to uh, 19.5 million base. So this is a really huge span. There are a lot of um, nucleotides that make up this whole sequence. So if we scroll down, we can get a better picture of what some of the data that's provided. So here we're seeing all of these different versions of genes and transcripts along uh, the section of the chromosome. There are some um, variants uh, and phenotypes that are observed. So the way that uh, the gene is expressed, what uh, the result is. So those main variants where maybe there's a base or a couple of sections that are different uh, and that results in a different expression um, of the gene. And here we get some information from GTEx. So uh, the tissues where uh, many uh, of these genes are most expressed. So GTEx is the genotype tissue expression uh, project where they've collected um, lots of different tissues across uh, human samples uh, and were able to measure how much is each of these genes expressed. And then you can look across all the tissues that they collected. Um, what kind of tissues, what parts of the body um, are these genes most uh, active in, uh, where um, they're the most produced. So there's a lot of uh, really cool information that we can understand from that as well. And then uh, here below, we can uh, select a lot of other custom tra uh, tracks. Uh, so if you're interested in learning a lot um, more or learning uh, about specific um, types of uh, expression, there are a lot of tracks that you can activate here. So this looks like a really good resource um, if they have this for your uh, organism. So I'm gonna scroll all the way back up to the top and we'll zoom in on a specific uh, gene. 
so the gene that we're going to want to look at is called um, DGCR2. Um, and this is the gene that is looked at at the tutorial, but um, you can also scroll around um, and uh, kind of play around with UCSC yourself. It's a really cool resource. Um, there are some tutorials that teach you how to uh, use it, but for uh, today's tutorial, we're just going to zoom in on DGCR2. Uh, and so UCSC tells me this is a, a gene uh, for DeGeorge syndrome. So I'm going to click on here. And now I get some uh, really detailed information, um, a little bit more zoomed in than what we saw before. So here we see DGCR2. It looks like there are three versions uh, of this gene. Uh, it looks like there are some kind of thin boxes here, some thicker boxes here. So maybe let's zoom out a little bit so we can see it in context. And it looks like there's a couple of different things around it, uh, some other genes perhaps, maybe a couple of other uh, transcripts. Um, and so the information that we get here from these arrows on these lines is that uh, this gene is on the reverse strand because the arrows are pointing left. Uh, so these transcripts that we have here on, uh, this one is pointing to the right, so that's the forward strand. So this is probably one of the results that we got in that um, in uh, that result table about where uh, the genes overlap. So uh, I want to take a look here because uh, I want to see where this box it, whether that overlaps with this one here. So to zoom in, I can select a specific section. So up up top here, I'm going to uh, click and drag across the area that I want to zoom in on. Uh, and then there's some more information here that I'm sure would make it <laughs> a little bit more helpful, some other ways that we can uh, interact with the genome browser in terms of uh, moving it around, but I'm just going to click zoom in to look closer at that section. And we get uh, a lot more refined information here. Um, so I'm, I'm still seeing that the user track looks a little bit different than um, what this track that's provided from gen code looks like. So uh, one way that we can uh, adjust that is uh, I'm going to right click here. Uh, to the left of this gen code section. And I see that the option that's selected here for the way that it's displayed is pack. Uh, and I really like that. Uh, so I'm going to see if the user track looks like that and to see if we can change that. Yeah, so here the representation looks like it's uh, dense. So to make that match up, I'm going to click on pack here. And that's something you can play around with as well. So it looks like there are a couple of different regions here um uh where we see these genes are overlapping um but i think the important piece for us to look at here is that these uh boxes uh they actually represent the exons so uh each uh gene uh once a copy of it is made so that it's uh can go and be produced into uh, a protein or another type of molecule um the whole entire gene isn't always used. Um, there are a lot of times the genes get uh, cut out into these different sections. Uh, some parts are removed and they're rearranged. Uh, and that's why we often see multiple versions of genes uh, here uh, because they have different uh, expressions as um, the transcribed and the translated products, which are, are fancy ways of talking about how uh, the biological ways about how uh, genes are processed and um, converted uh, into these products. So one of those ways that it's processed is chunks are removed. And so the chunks that end up getting kept are called exons. So here the exons are represented uh, here. We can see in that tooltip uh, below that this is exon one of two in this transcript. So uh, this part is kept. Uh, so then uh, I'm seeing here that these two exons are not overlapping, um, which means that 
ultimately this part in between them where, where there is this overlap, there isn't anything that's necessarily going um, from the gene uh, to a product that is uh, expressed or created out of that gene. So I think this leads us uh, into maybe a little bit of a different question that we want to ask. Now that we did this analysis, we saw this result, uh, maybe we want to see, we learned that there are genes that overlap, but now maybe we can get more specific and, and ask, are there exons that overlap? Are there pieces of the genes that are coding uh, into a product that overlap? And what does that look like? So first we were looking at this question, do the genes overlap? And we found that they do. That happens pretty, pretty often. But now we might wanna see, do the exons overlap? So do these um, sections that create actual molecules, do those overlap? So what we just saw was something like this, where we have an exon, maybe they're lined up, but there's a gap between them uh, where there's that part of the gene that gets discarded and is not um, expressed. So we would want to maybe redo our analysis to look at whether or not the exons overlap. Um, so these sections that are coding. So what does this mean for us? Do we have to start from scratch? Do we have to, you know, walk through every single step again? And you know, this hour of work that we've done? Thankfully, no. And we can do that in Galaxy uh, using what's called workflows. So we did all of these steps here where we brought in the genes, we extracted which were forward uh, and on the reverse strand, we checked which of those were overlapping and ultimately got this list of the overlapping genes, both on the forward and the reverse strands. Uh, and that, uh, was really informative to us, right? We learned that this overlap happens a lot. Um, and so how can we uh, do this again, looking at the exons? Uh, and so, like I said, the way that we can do that is using workflows. So because we did all this work, we set up all these steps that we want to run, the next thing that we'll want to do uh, and is really handy in Galaxy is that we can make a workflow out of this history. So the way that I'm going to do that is uh, up at the right uh, in this history panel, we could either create a new history, we could switch between some of the histories that we have, uh, or we can look at the history options. So let's click on that. So let's see, delete, export, export history to file, extract workflow, let's do that. So now I'm taking to this page where I see everything that was in my history. And now I get the option uh, to see what tool I ran and the history items created. So since we were working from uh, a pretty well-developed tutorial and we knew the workflow that we were running through, all the tools did what we wanted, we want to keep all the steps that we did uh, and keep them in our workflow. Uh, sometimes when I'm doing an analysis for the first time, and actually a lot of times, there are a lot of steps that happen where, oh, that tool didn't give me the result, uh, the result that I really expected, or I kind of went down uh, in a direction that didn't end up leading me to my answer. Uh, so we could then remove, uncheck the boxes that didn't lead us to the result that we wanted um, so that when we uh, run this workflow, we can just tell it, start with this data set and get me to this output without having to do any extra analysis. So I'm going to rename my workflow and I'm gonna call this overlapping, well, I could call it genes um, and this could be pretty specific to genes, but all the steps that we did are pretty generalizable. So we could run this on a data set of exons um, and then we'd also get uh, the result that we're looking for. So a more general word that we can use that would include things like genes and exons is uh, features. Uh, and then something about this workflow too is that it runs on opposite strands. Um, so that's going to help me when I look at this workflow in the future to remember, okay, this is looking for features on opposite strands. I'm not just looking at one, uh, one strand. Okay, so now I'm going to create the workflow. So workflow overlapping features on opposite strands. 
that's created from the current history. You can edit or run the workflow. Uh, before we run it again, I'm going to click on edit. Uh, and this is going to help us see uh, the structure of our workflow. So we get a kind of compact view first. So I, you can kind of drag and expand and move things around to make it a little bit uh, more pretty, uh, a little bit easier to see which data is going where. Let's pull this out a little bit. Awesome. So now I can follow the workflow here in a visual way. So the genes uh, go through these filters. Uh, these filters were filtering on the forward strand, the reverse strand, and then we saw the intersect uh, on both of those directions that led us to our final data set. Uh, and so because I want to keep this workflow, I want to uh, use it again and again, it's going to help me to label each of these steps so that when I'm running it the next time, uh, the results will be a little bit easier for me to follow rather than having to investigate every data set. So to do that, I'm going to click on this box for my first step with the genes, and I'm going to call this uh, instead uh, features on overlapping strands. So my input can be um, genes, exons, introns, if we're interested, uh, so we can make that selection. So this filter, uh, that step was looking for features on forward strand. So the next one was looking at the features on reverse strand. So now we had uh, intersect uh, of the forward and reverse, those we can keep the same, and then concatenate data sets. So this is gonna be overlapping features, both strands. All right, so now we have our, our workflow. It's nicely labeled. We can also uh, shrink each of these panels so that we can uh, take a better view at the workflow or zoom out. So, you know, if you have some monster workflow that's working on tons of inputs and lots of steps and everything's going everywhere, you can get a really nice uh, overview of uh, what's going on. So uh, also you could continue building out your workflow. You can add additional steps uh, right in this editor. So say for example, maybe uh, at the end, once I get my overlapping features, I might want to sort uh, those features. So in the tool panel on the left, I can click on filter and sort, and I can click on sort and then add it as the last step in my workflow, uh, connect this output uh, and set it as the input to my sort data set, and then rename this sort to my uh, final uh, version. So I'd call that overlapping features on both strands. So this is a really handy way to uh, have a high level view of the workflow um, rather than what we saw linearly in the history. Um, and so because I, I don't necessarily want to sort at the end, I'm going to remove this and I'm going to click on save workflow uh, so that now I can rerun this uh, workflow um, on any kind of input data, data that I want. So the next thing that we'll want to do now that we have our workflow set up is uh, now we can more easily think about our question, uh, which was, um, you know, we looked at the genes that were overlapping, but now we want to take a look at the exons that were overlapping. So to get back to see my history, I'm doing, going to click on this home button. So that's going to take me back. And now um, let's bring in some data from uh, UCSC again, looking at the exons. So the uh, tutorial covers a different way that you can uh, get this data. So say for example, you were looking across the entire uh, genome and you already spent a lot, of, uh, a lot of time getting that data uploaded into, into Galaxy. So, this data set actually does have uh, information on the exons, uh, the exon, excuse me, uh, in this section beyond that column six that we originally looking at. So 
there are some tools that you can use. It's described in the uh, tutorial of how then you can extract these details about the exons um, so that you don't have to go through that process of, of bringing in the data again. Um, but because we're looking just at one chromosome, I'm going to go back to UCSC to get that data. So again, in the tool panel, I'm going to click get data. I'm going to find the UCSC main table browser. So at this point, we're going to keep things all the same. Uh, but now one thing that is different is that the position uh, UCSC remembers um, from the genome browser that we were looking at this specific section. So if there was other information that we wanted to get or to organize it in a different way, uh, that's really handy that it'll remind us uh, and kind of put in those coordinates already within the genome. So we want to look for the exons that are across the whole chromosome 22. So I'm just going to remove that selection. And then on the second page, we are going to select here uh, that we want to get not the whole gene, but we want to get the coding exons. So those exons that are going to um, become part of, uh, end up as part of the RNA, and then that will get translated into a protein. So I'm going to click that uh, to get those specific exons and send my query to Galaxy. All right, job successfully added to the queue. So now we have uh, another data set that we've brought in. It's added as another item to our history. Uh, this time, this is going to be the exon. So uh, we'll give that a couple of moments to run. And then we'll want to make sure that we rename it so that uh, we can keep track of uh, the difference between these two data sets that we had. Now, what I did here was I brought in this data set into my current history, uh, which is unnamed so far. So in this history, uh, in this analysis, I was looking at the overlapping genes on chromosome 22. So uh, I might want to rename this history uh, for this specific analysis to say, this is where I found those overlapping genes. Uh, let's see, did I say that correctly? There it goes. Okay, now it's updated. So overlapping genes chromosome 22. And here I just brought in a data set of exons. So I'm going to rename that as well. So this uh, uh, is exons chromosome 22. Scroll to the bottom and click save. So I could keep this analysis uh, in the same history, um, but it might help me in the future if I'm kind of looking at specific steps to actually put this in a different history. Um, so I'm going to do that. Uh, and I could have uh, started a new history and brought in that data set uh, directly into that new history, but you know, I, I, I was a little excited about bringing in this exon, so I didn't quite um, do that. So I can actually move this data set from this history to a new history. So to do that, I'm going to click on create new history. So now I see that this history is empty. So I'm going to um, first name this overlapping exons chromosome 22 and click save. So I know which history to move this to. And then I can click on history options, show history side by side. And now I'm going to see um, all of my previous histories that I have. So I'm going to select histories here. This is the current history that I'm in. Uh, so I want to uh, get some, get that data set, those exons from this overlapping genes history. So I'm going to add that selected history to my view. And now I can simply drag and drop this exons data set, and it's going to get copied into this history now. So 
the Exxon's data set is currently taking up some of the room. Now I have two copies of this Exxon's. It's taking up some of the room of this history that I have. So what I can do is I can delete it from this history and it's still going to stay uh, in my new history here, the over overlapping exons. So we see that this number about how much space uh, this history is taking up didn't change. Uh, so the way that we can uh, go and make sure that history gets deleted, uh, you know, like your email, you might delete it, but then it goes into your trash folder. Um, we can uh, actually go and do that uh, final delete. So I'm going to switch to my overlapping genes history. And then here I get to see that I have six data sets and one deleted data set. So I'm gonna click on that. And here, the deleted data set that I have is my, my exons. So here, what I can do is click on this uh, cog and click purge all deleted content. So do I really wanna delete, delete this data? Uh, yes, because I have a copy in my other history, so I'm going to click OK. So now that uh, removed this data set, so I'm back under uh, two megabytes of data. So uh, now I'm, I'm not using unnecessary disk space. OK, so let's switch back to this overlapping exons history so now we can run our workflow. OK. Uh, so no data found for selected filter. I think the selected filter was still the deleted data set. So I'm going to click here to show active. Okay, <laughs> we're good. We're in good shape. So now what we can do is run our workflow, finally. So I'm going to come up to the top here in the masthead and click on workflow. And right here at the top, I see this uh, workflow that I made a couple of minutes ago. So here I could click on the name. There are a couple of things that I can do, edit, copy, see the indications, the previous times that I've run this workflow. Uh, but what I wanna do here is run it. So I'll click on run. So now I have this uh, similar uh, form that we've seen before where uh, we're gonna look for uh, features on the overlapping strands. And the option that I get to run this on is the data set that's in my history. So I wanna run it on the exons on chromosome 22. And so uh, there's this nice way that I can, I don't have to see all of the steps, uh, but for the sake of kind of seeing what that looks like, uh, now we get to see all of these other steps that uh, are going to be part of this workflow. Uh, we have an option to send the results to a new history um, but I, I created this history specifically to look at the exons, uh, so I'm going to say no. Now, when we were looking at the intersect on the, um, on the genes, we were looking at where there was an intersect of at least one base pair. So another note about exons is that um, once uh, that DNA uh, is processed, all of the exons um, are chopped out of the DNA and they're combined into what's called RNA. That RNA, when it gets translated into uh, a product uh, or like a protein, the, each part of the exon, it's read in, uh, in chunks of three bases long. So this product that's created by these three are called amino acids. And these are the building blocks of our protein. So it's these uh, amino acids that then get created all lined up uh, and they get formed into our protein. So those uh, amino acids, again, are made out of those three nucleotides. So uh, we can even in our workflow adjust here uh, and edit uh, where we might want to look instead of just one base pair that overlaps, um, maybe we can look at a place where uh, there are three, um, maybe nine nucleotides that overlap so that we get three of these amino acids in a row. So I'm gonna click um, nine here, and then I'm going to do the same thing uh, on that opposite intersect. So uh, I can click edit here, change that to a nine, and that way we're looking at these um, 
sections in the exons that are going to give us a little bit uh, of a, a longer uh, section that we're looking for so that we see these amino acids that actually turn into, into products. So I was able to say change that for this run of the workflow. So you can still customize um, the type of analysis that you're doing. Um, you can make these adjustments in the parameters, especially if you're looking for something a little bit more specific. So now that I've made those adjustments, um, what I'm going to do is uh, scroll back up to the top and click run workflow. So we successfully invoked our workflow overlapping features on opposite strands. So you can check the status of the queue jobs and view the resulting data in the history panel. So right now, uh, we see that uh, under this summary section that it's waiting to co complete uh, invocation one. So uh, everything at this point is still being loaded. Um, and as the workflow completes, we'll have more items that are added to the top of our history. Wow, they all, they all just popped up. Um, so we have our original data set and now uh, it's pretty similar to uh, what our history looked like before, except for there are some jobs that can run at the same time. So starting with that initial data set, we have that filter where we're looking for the uh, positive strand exons and the, uh, the forward strand exons and the reverse strand exons. So we can't process the intersect steps until we get these uh, overlap, uh, until we get these uh, exons on one strand on the opposite strand um, filtered out. So once that's complete, both of those intersects are done and only when those uh, intersect files are created can we concatenate them. So here we just are able to go through the whole process with our workflow that we did before. But now that our workflow is done, we can um, we can uh, run this really quickly uh, in a matter of a couple of minutes. So our workflow has finished running, and I got really excited about running it again that I didn't even take a look at the data sets that we had. So uh, that's kind of one temptation with workflows is that uh, you can, uh, it's just really exciting that I can save a lot of time, run all these steps, um, but it's still really important to keep in mind uh, is the data that I'm running uh, through this workflow, um, is this workflow really gonna get me the result that I want or process this data in the way that I want it to? So let's do a little bit of exploration uh, of our data. So like we talked about uh, with genes, um, there are going to be many exons within those genes, right? So uh, the exon is going to be a section of that gene. So if we started out with 5,000, here we see that there are 18,000, uh, 18,473 exons uh, that are within those 5,000 plus genes that we looked at uh, in the last data set. So we would expect uh, maybe close to half to be on the forward strand, maybe half on the reverse strand. So here we had uh, almost 53% on the forward strand. Uh, and then on the reverse strand, about 47% of the genes are on there. So that's pretty similar to what we saw previously. And then what we saw on the intersect is actually only five uh, exons overlap uh, on the positive strand uh, with exons on the reverse strand. And only seven uh, on the reverse strand overlap with those on the positive strand. So, wow, last time we had about, what, 1,000 um, on each. So we saw that the gene overlap was really, really common. But here we're seeing in the combination, there are only 12 uh, regions, there are only 12 exons that overlap uh, with chromosome, uh, on chromosome 22. So we did a lot of work. We found out that this is actually really rare, um, you could say, uh, in this chromosome. So maybe that now that we've done this analysis, you might want to see, well, what does this look like across the entire genome? Or uh, 
a human genome? Or maybe is this more common in other organisms than it is in humans? Uh, you could also play around with the versions of things that we used, right? So here we used that December 2013 assembly, that reference of the human genome. Maybe you could see, wow, okay, so now we have a lot more data about the human genome. What does this look like on the most complete version that we have today? Um, in those uh, sections of the genome that were really complicated to try to put together, does this happen more? Does this happen less? Or about the same amount? So there are a lot of uh, cool directions that we can take this, and especially with the workflow, right? That, that only took a couple of minutes. Um, so a lot of uh, cool directions that we could take this in to understand where the exons overlap. And then we can also try to understand more information about these exons. So what genes are they from or what proteins do they make? Uh, is this specifically in a immune, uh, an immune uh, products or uh, proteins that are important for different types of functions? Uh, and is this more common in certain ones than others? Uh, so there's a lot more information that we can try to understand here, but uh, the tutorial that we've worked through today uh, really nicely tells us each of the steps that we have to do, all the parameters that we have to set, the specific kind of data that we need. But once we get into this place where we're asking more questions, it's really exciting because there's a lot we can understand. Uh, but it's also uh, can be more frustrating because then uh, the job is on us to look for uh, different tools and make sure we play with the parameters just right to get that information. So hopefully this is a, a nice introduction to Galaxy for you, hopefully a nice introduction to genomics. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the smorgasbord week. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the Slack. Um, there are going to be lots of folks available to help you. I'd be happy to help you uh, through if there are any places where you get stuck as well. So happy smorgasbord. Thanks, everybody.